Herbert made his way through the busy Casbah streets of Algiers. His pale skin burned in the relentless African sun, and breathing the thick animal stench mixed with spices and incense was exhausting. This was no place for tourists, but Herbert had important business which, he, which could not be solved elsewhere. The, t the old town was a labyrinth of narrow streets going up and down the hill. Finding your way was anything but easy. To keep the peace and cover and control over the city, there were soldiers in every corner, or rather it was supposed to be. The Casbah remained a bastion for rebels, and simply posting guards would not help, as they could easily be picked off by assassins. Instead, there were large patrols of fifteen or more men marching up and down the already crowded streets. Even as a European, Herbert was not spared from harassment. He was repeatedly being stopped by patrols asking for papers, and he had to listen to their friendly advice about not fraternizing with the locals. The upside of all this was that his French had improved tremendously these last few weeks. Farage stood outside the mosque waiting for his foreign friend. He was happy and excited, but did everything in his power to avoid appearing giddy in front of the French patrol. He knew how dangerous the city had become since the French arrived and did not want to draw attention to himself. Tension was high, and if the French soldiers would suspect that something had gone awry, they wouldn't hesitate to clear the streets and imprison anyone who protested. Farage said a pleased voice from behind him. Herbert! Farage hugged his friend. They stood there for a moment, clapping backs brotherly. So many years, my friend, so many years, said Farage. I'm happy to see you again, but this is not the place for pleasantries. Do you have somewhere we can go? asked Herbert. Of course, follow me. They made their way towards the harbor and took an abrupt turn into an even narrower alleyway. I made good time, said Herbert, looking at his gold watch. Oh, really? Did you? laughed Farage. Yes, look, not even six o'clock. Farage stopped and looked up looked at the wind-up pocket watch. He turned the screw connected to the spring and tapped on the glass. The arms started turning again. Farage set the clock to show the right time. There you go, my friend. Oh, said Herbert, disappointed. I'm sorry. Don't worry. Did you have trouble finding the mosque? It was a splendid idea to find each other by looking for the min minaret tower, but the streets are so unpredictable. As soon as I thought I had arrived, the street would go off in a different direction. It took me quite some time to find a way leading all the way to the mosque. Sounds a lot like the Caspah, said Farage, and laughed. They arrived on the other side of the alleyway, a larger and much busier street. Peddlers and merchants moved their wares in a long and disjointed street market. Do you need anything? I have a cousin selling the finest carpets in Algiers, or maybe a new watch, teased Farage. Ha! Thank you, but I'm trying to plan a trip to the desert. Farage stopped and looked serious for a moment. Are you going, Herbert? Are you really? He said, uh, unable to hold back his smile. Signed and paid for by the British Museum. Farage laughed in triumph. You crazy infidel! How do you do it? I told them I had a map, said Herbert, with a straight face. Farage seemed to lose his steam, replacing his joy with determination. We shouldn't talk about this in the streets. Come, this way. Captain Ambrose of the French army moved his patrol through the busy harbor. Call it instinct or experience, he knew something was afoot. There was something about the merchandise the loaders moved. Why were there so many sealed crates? The majority of the goods shipped to Algiers was, n was grain and oil. Barrels and sacks was a common sight, not unmarked board crates. You there, Ambrose called out to a loader on the docks. What are you moving? I don't know, it's not mine, he answered. I need to see the customs slip for these items immediately. The words fell on deaf ears. The men kept moving the goods. Ambrose followed the men carrying the crates with his eyes. They all moved goods from a single sebrick, a small and fast ship common in these parts of the world. Ambrose eyed the growing pile of crates on the docks. Is there a problem, Captain? asked a calm Arab behind him. Ambrose turned around to face the man. Perhaps. Are these yours? Yes, yes they are, the man nodded to his workers to start loading the crates on a wagon. Nobody touches the crates until I get some answers around here, yelled Ambrose. My name is Abd al Qadir Bahij, and, the, and the, here is my papers identification, customs, and tariff slip. Open one. Captain, they have already been checked and accounted for by the customs. The customs controlled by your government. I don't care. Open one. Ambrose gestured to his men. Captain, you are performing a criminal act by opening that crate. It's, it is not your business. My business is the Caspa and what you are trying to smuggle into it. 
No need to get upset, Captain. It says so right on the custom slip. Food stuff. The crate cra creaked as the soldiers cracked it open. Captain, said one of the soldiers, it's grain, sir. Bahij and Ambrose looked at the long open crate. It looked like a small coffin filled with grain. Ambrose noticed that Bahij held his breath a moment before he exhaled. Ambrose turned around and kicked, o kicked the open crate over. The grain poured out, exposing a stack of rifles. Farage poured Herbert some tea and sat down on the pillowed seat. Herbert looked awkward sitting on the floor. Farage snickered at his attempts to keep a straight back. I'm glad my troubles entertain you. Posture is important, you know, labored Herbert. You need more pillows, offered Farage. Thank you, I will be all right. Herbert glanced around the room. It was as comfortable as a drawing room, but it looked nothing like the ones he had found in Europe. Locum, Farage held out a plate of sweets. Delights! Don't mind if I do, said Herbert, and he picked up one of the sweets. I forget, you are British. Turkish delights, am I right? Yes, that's what we call them. Herbert finished his delight and quickly went for another one. Careful with the rose-flavored ones. They are said to ease your mind, but also make you forget things. I'm old. My memory is already abandoning ship, jested Herbert. Farage sipped on his tea. He was happy having his friend in his home. It saddened him that they would have to engage in business instead of merriment. Herbert, do you really think you'll be able to pull this off? The expedition? Most certainly. What have you told what have you told your people in London? asked Farage. The truth that we are going to find the legendary tomb of Tin Hinan. Farage was worried that Herbert did not fully appreciate the situation. Herbert, I told you it it is bigger than that. Farage, don't worry. I remember what you told me about Johann Weyer and his research. I know you think it is important. Farage smiled, feeling silly that he would ever doubt his friend. You realize what this means? They could all be travelers. Even God could be a concept from the beyond, brought to us by missionaries, like it was brought to the natives in the, in the Americas. Maybe they are speaking to him, like an ordinary man. Wouldn't you like to speak to, no, with the Almighty? Herbert fell silent. He didn't know how to handle religion. The Church of England had never impressed him, and when he looked beyond the borders of the kingdom, all religions became mythical. He had never found God, and it concerned him. He wanted to sympathize with Farage, but couldn't. Well, said Herbert, I guess we'll find out. Farage calmed down once again, ashamed to have worked himself up so much, especially in front of a friend with such composure. Herbert never got riled up, thought Farage. He produced a map and splayed it on the floor in front of them. It was a printed map of the northern desert. Farage had made extensive notes on it describing the exact route. Where is all this information from, said Herbert, pointing at the notes. From here and there, but... Farage turned the map over, revealing the, bl the back covered in sketches and more notes. These are all from Weyer. What is this? Herbert pointed out a star shape. Weyer describes it as a marker, answered Farage. For what? Who knows? Farage pointed out another sketch of a circle and a hand. Now this, this is the key. Ambrose ordered his men to fire at the fleeing rebels, raiding Abd al Abd al Qadir Bahij grain granaries and storehouses had stirred up a hornet's nest of resistance. Countless of French soldiers had reinforced the already crowded battle, and the harbor had turned into a killing field. The rebels, rebels scattered and fled into the narrow streets. After them! Let's quench this rebellion once and for all! screamed Ambrose, and pushed, pushed his patrol up the Kasbah Hill. Four young men suddenly invaded Farage's home. Herbert and Farage could hear them storm the entrance. Uncle, you must run! They are killing everyone! shouted one of them from, from the other room. Farage got to his feet and hurried to see what it was all about. His nephew Baki came into the room. Baki pointed accusingly at Herbert. Uncle, what are you doing? He is one of them! No, Baki, he is not like them. He is English. He is European! Baki pulled a dagger and pushed Farage out of the way. Herbert didn't understand a word and feared for his life. Baki called one of the men from the other room. They are coming! We must go! Don't hurt him, please! pleaded Farage. The patrol was waiting patiently for their compa compatriots to lure out the rebels. Two ranks were formed, five men in front kneeling, five men in the back standing. They had their rifles ready and waited for Ambrose Sabre to come down, ordering them to shoot. The four rebels emerged from the house with a white man held as hostage. "'Put your weapons away or we kill this man!' yelled Baki, holding his knife demonstratively next to Herbert. "'Please don't!' cried Farage from the side. "'Ready? Aim!' 
called Ambrose to his men. The threat ter turned the rebels frantic, but had little time to react. The street was narrow. They were, they were trapped. Farage stepped out between the two sides. Stop this madness! Ambrose let his saber fall in a swift motion. Fire! Farage felt himself hit the ground. What was happening? Everything had gone silent. His eyes focused. Baki's lifeless body lay collapsed on the ground just a few feet away. They had killed Baki. What a waste of life. He tried to look around to see the others, but he couldn't move his head. Had they all been killed? Farage realized he wasn't feeling well, mostly because he didn't feel anything at all. He prayed that Herbert was safe. Farage, can you hear me? Yes, Herbert, I hear you, my friend. Are you all right? Herbert knew it was bad. He took Farage's hand and held it close to his chest. Herbert, you are unhurt, smiled Farage, saved by the color of your skin. Herbert hung his head in shame. Farewell, Farage, my friend. Farage exhaled. His head fell back on the ground. Herbert reached out to close his eyelids. Degage! I can't pronounce that word. Yelled one of the so one of the soldiers. Kicked Herbert. European! Yelled Herbert. Get out of here, stupid Englishman! Before I shoot you. You just shot my friend. The soldier fired a warning shot. Herbert quickened and fled into the narrow Casbah streets. He ran like never before, back to the hotel and to the safety of his luxurious hotel room. Herbert sat with his assistant, Daniel, in the hotel restaurant. Daniel noticed that Herbert was quiet this evening, but thought little of it. He picked up the, the weak old London Times and began to read. It was the same articles he had read the day before. I think I'll be turning in. Good night, Professor. Herbert mumbled and made a small gesture with his hand. Daniel left and went upstairs. Ambrose came up to the to the table and dropped the map in front of Herbert. He sat down in Daniel's seat and took a sip from his drink. Herbert didn't know what to think. He quickly reached for the map. Before he could collect it, Ambrose tossed a stone onto, onto the map. The gilded table below resonated with a clang. Herbert looked around with a slight panic and then d down the map at the star-shaped stone. What is that? asked Herbert. That is my question, he answered dryly. You are lucky that there are so few Brits in Algeria, Professor. Professor. What do you want? I want to know what it is, and why there is a picture of this stone on the back of your map. Herbert was speechless. He really didn't know much. Tin Hanan? Was that it? He didn't believe that. There was more. It was that Tin Hanan... It was what Tin Hanan might have been. Where she came from. Where she went. I understand, said Ambrose. You wouldn't want to tell me. We are not exactly best friends. Know this. This stone has been in my family for something like three centuries, ever since the siege of Calais. It has fueled the men in my family with great spirit, but also madness. You know, inspiration to the point of obsession. I never really bought into the whole thing, but I must admit seeing you with this fills me with a sense of purpose and closure. Are you giving this to me? Herbert was dumbfounded. I'm not doing you a favor, Englishman. This is for my father and my father's father and so on. It's on to you now. Good luck. Herbert and the expedition left the next morning, heading off into the Algerian desert. He would never forget the, the pain of losing Farage, or the strange meeting with the French officer. The map constantly reminded him of the sacrifices made, and the stone, determination lasting centuries.